the throne of God above. I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, it's lovely to be with you again. Uh, I hope you've managed to survive the storms and the wind and the rain uh, and all that came. Goodness me, uh, it was uh, a little frightening. Uh, quite heavy rain at times and, and really, really strong winds, wasn't it? Um, I know on Friday uh, we had the funeral of Lynn Howarth uh, in Settle and, and goodness me, um, the, the wind and the rain uh, outside, but thankfully it held off uh, while we were at the graveside, so that was a real blessing. Uh, we will, of course, remember Harry and the family in our prayers today. Um, but it's lovely to be with you. Uh, we've got a bit of a treat again today. Um, you, don't, you don't have to listen to me all morning. Um, we have the, the brilliant um, Dr. Andrew Ollerton from the Bible Society um, preaching for us again today. Uh, and it's a, a lovely word that he's put together for us from um, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, which is talking about what it means to have a living hope. Uh, and perhaps we've needed that living hope over these past couple of years, um, uh, perhaps just over these past few days as the storms have brewed um, physically or, or even metaphorically or symbolically for you. Um, and so we're going to hear this morning this wonderful message of living hope uh, from 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, something to look forward to. Uh, look, as we begin our service this morning, we're going to come before God with some praise and worship. So let's just commend this time to God. So be still for a moment. Loving God, we've come before you this morning in our homes dispersed, where, wherever we are. But we pray that you bind our hearts to one another. We pray that even as we watch this at different times, we might be yet still one fellowship with one another and with you. For we enjoy among ourselves the fellowship of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would minister to us, speak into our hearts this morning, Lord, of the living hope that you call us to. We pray for all those who've been affected by the storms in the last few days. 
we pray, Lord, that you would be alongside them in their time of distress and discomfort. May they know your peace in the midst of this storm. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing our first hymn this morning, uh, and it's the wonderful Majesty. Uh, majesty. Let's sing and worship together. song that is uh, isn't it and, and takes us before the very throne of God uh, 
Here I stand, humbled by the love that you give, forgiven, so that I can forgive. Here I stand, knowing that I'm your desire, sanctified by glory and fire. Uh, at the end of the day, that hymn speaks of love, of God's deep love for us. Now I've found the greatest love of all is mine, for you laid down your life, the greatest sacrifice. Uh, and that, of course, is where we find our living hope, that we might stand before the living God and be made whole in his sight by the greatest love of all. <laughs> a couple of things I wanted to signpost uh, as we uh, move forward in our church life. Uh, we're coming up to Lent, of course. Um, we have a, a couple of Lent courses going on in different places, um, but I particularly wanted just to mention um, a, a couple of things at Settle Church. Um, so next Sunday morning is an arrangement service. It's uh, hymns of praise, songs of praise, uh, and you get to choose. Uh, so if you'd like to go along to that, it'll be a lovely, uh, happy, joyous occasion. Uh, and if you don't like the hymns, well, <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> it's not the fault of the preacher this time. Um, so do nominate hymns. Let, let Philip Taylor know, uh, or, or even just turn up on the day. Um, but we'll, we'll put together some hymns for that service, and, and it'll be um, favourite hymns uh, of the congregation there at Settle. Um, I wanted to just mention as well Ash Wednesday, um, so the, the 2nd of uh, March, there's an Ash Wednesday service. Wendy Holt will be leading that for us. Um, I'm actually on holiday uh, for 10 days or so at the beginning of March. Um, so Wendy will be leading our Ash Wednesday service. Um, but do come along to that if you'd like to. Um, and then uh, the first Sunday in March, I'm delighted to say that we've got a speaker from uh, Arosha, from Eco Church, uh, the company, the organisation that run Eco Church, um, which is called Arosha. Um, Pam Martin is going to come and speak to us um, and she's going to tell us some good news stories. We, we hear a lot of the, the, the bad stuff, the things we need to give up and um, Pam is going to, I think, share with us about creation care um, and some good news stories of churches who've um, sought eco-church status and, and have gone on to, to make a, a huge difference uh, to their communities and to the natural world. Um, delighted to say, and I'm sure I shared this a couple of weeks ago, I was so thrilled with the news that we um, at Settle are now a silver um, eco church. We just got our silver award, um, and I'm really thrilled with that. Um, but do come along to hear Pam Martin. I, I think she'll be a really interesting speaker. Um, and so that's a, a regular morning service, 10 30, uh, Settle on the, the 6th of March. Um, and finally, just a signpost that on the 20th of March, um, David Goodall um, is leading a service on Methodist way of life. So David is the district mission enabler. Uh, he's based in Leeds, but he spends his time going around the circuit um, talking about um, Methodist way of life, as well as um, a, a bunch of other stuff around mission. Um, David is a lovely speaker, and he's going to lead some workshops for us on that day. Um, so do please come along to that. It, it's for all of the churches in our circuit uh, to join together to think about how we live uh, life according to uh, to God's rule, uh, according to a, a daily rhythm. Um, David's focus particularly is on a Methodist way of life. Um, so there'll be some particular Methodist uh, emphases in that service. Um, but I think it's about our devotional life. It's It's um, looking at how we find a, a pattern, uh, a rhythm, um, a, a discipline, if you want to call it that, but it's leading us into discipleship, uh, and it's how we become deeper disciples of Jesus Christ. Enough of all that. We're going to sing again. Uh, the wonderful, amazing love. Amazing love. Let's sing. Spirit is within me. We 
that is and what a brilliant recording of it um, uh, let's just pray for a moment shall we gracious God we're forgiven because you were forsaken we're accepted because you went to the cross in our place we're alive and well your spirit is within us because you died and rose again gracious God you are the source of all our hope May our hope be a living hope, a hope that looks forward to your life lived out in us. And so we pray, Lord, we pray for our community, we pray for our fellow church members, we pray for all those who had difficulties following the storms in the last couple of days. We pray for all those who suffered these past two years through COVID. We pray for all those who, even now, are struggling with mental health. 
with relationships, with work. God, we pray that you would come alongside them. May they know your peace in the midst of this time of storm. We pray for all who are sick, all who suffer in mind, body or spirit. God, may they know your healing life, the closeness of your spirit, your renewal in their bodies and in their minds. We pray for all who mourn. We pray for the family of Lynn Howarth. And we pray for the family of Ruth Evans. God, you said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we pray, may your spirit so surround them. May your peace so fill them. May your presence so comfort them that their hope is all in you. We pray for our nation and we pray for our world, seemingly on the brink of war. We pray for the situation in Ukraine, a situation that feels so out of our hands. God, we pray for peace. We pray for peacemakers. May you and you alone be our living hope. And we pray for the life of our planet, for the imbalance in creation. God, may your spirit once again move upon the chaos of this world and restore it to order. Renew, remake, redeem and restore. Gracious God, we pray. May we be the instruments in your hands. May we, your church, proclaim your renewal and your redemption to all creation. Oh God, we conclude our prayers by sharing the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing again before we hear from um, Dr. Andrew Ollerton, uh, his wonderful sermon on the living hope. Um, and we're going to sing a very appropriate hymn. This is called uh, All My Hope. All My Hope is in you. Let's worship together.
wonderful hymn that is, isn't it? And and it sets us up to to hear this word from um, Andrew Ollerton. Uh, Andrew, as I mentioned before, is um, from the Bible Society. Uh, we've heard from him a couple of weeks ago, uh, and the, the message that he's going to bring us was originally uh, written as a, a message for just after Easter, when we're celebrating the the resurrection of Christ and why the resurrection makes a difference to us in the here and now. But it just felt as I was listening to it and thinking through this week that it's a message that we need to hear now in, in the midst of the, the darkness and the storms that have raged through our country and, and feel like they're raging across the world as we prayed in our intercessions. But we need to hear the message of hope and to feel some certainty uh, in that hope that we have. So let's just pray for a moment and commit this time to God. Loving God, as we go into this scripture, as we think about what it means to have a living hope in you, we pray that you would minister to our hearts. Come close to us, loving God, in the power of your spirit, in the name of Jesus, may we meet you in this time. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Uh, enjoy this message. Our horizons have collapsed a bit and so I wanted to get out and just remind myself of the bigger picture. And I've done it early this morning so that I could see this. It's sunrise. The sun is just coming up. It's about six in the morning. And it reminds us of the beauty of sunrise, but also that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has risen from the dead. We've just celebrated at Easter time the resurrection of Jesus, who broke the power of death and has brought hope back into our human story. And I want to unpack that hope for us in this message because just as the sun rises on the far horizon and shines its light of warmth and hope back to us on the near horizon, that's how Christian hope works. It puts something certain on the far horizon, the resurrection of Jesus and the hope that we have waiting for us in glory and that hope shines its rays back to where we live and says if Jesus rose again on Easter Sunday you can have hope on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, whatever challenges we're facing. Right now our world is challenged. We're facing enormous challenges and including in that is the threat of death and of sickness and of tragedy. And into that darkness shines the light of Christian hope. Into that darkness shines the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to unpack today this simple message that says this, because he has risen on the far horizon, we can have hope on the near horizon. Because of Easter Sunday, we've got a living hope on Monday and every day, whatever challenges we're facing. Or you could say the headline of the message is this, because Christ Jesus is risen, life is not a hopeless end, life is an endless hope. And I want to unpack that from a scripture in 1 Peter, but perhaps my favorite part of the Bible. In 1 Peter, we simply read these verses. I'll read it to you as you enjoy the sunrise. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, that is kept in heaven for you. Okay, so let's unpack this passage from 1 Peter chapter 1 and our living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The way Christian hope works, as I've said, is it puts something glorious on the far horizon and it shines its light back to us on the near horizon. Because of what is coming, we can live with hope today. And I want to therefore unpack, firstly, what is our future hope on the far horizon? And then how does that hope help us live well on this near horizon? We're gonna look at the scriptures together. So you might have 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 open before you. And I'm also gonna look in Hebrews and think about this hope. And you notice firstly that the writer of 1 Peter says that this living hope, he says, is kept in heaven for you. In other words, hope, unlike in the way we use the word in colloquial speech, where we say, well, I hope so, or I hope it doesn't rain today. And what we mean is I'm really not certain about anything. So I use the word hope. In the Bible, hope isn't like that. Hope is a certain word. It's a solid, shining, definite thing that is so certain you can already begin to live for it. Peter says it's like an inheritance. 
kept in heaven for you. You've been born into God's family. You've got an inheritance. It's coming your way. And it's so certain you can begin to live for it now. When I was born, unbeknownst to me, my grandfather set up a child inheritance bond in my name. He put a significant amount of money into an account and basically from the moment I was born, it was mine. It was earning interest year on year. And when I was 21 years of age, it would be released for me to spend. Well, I can still remember the moment, I think I was about age 11, when my parents told me of the existence of this child inheritance bond. Honestly, for an 11 year old boy, that gave a whole new reason for living. Uh, all I had to do was get to 21 and it was mine, right? And Peter says, that's, your, that's what hope is like. It's an inheritance already set up in your name. And when you arrive in glory, it will all be yours to enjoy. The inheritance of knowing God for eternity through Jesus Christ. It's that kind of certain hope. Now, I realize some of you might be thinking, well, this is all very positive, but how can we know what is certain on that far horizon? None of us have been there, right? We, we, we who are living, by definition, have not died and we don't know what comes next. So how can we be certain about anything? And have you noticed that those who do die don't seem to come back to tell us what comes next? So how can we know? Well, the answer the Bible gives is because Jesus Christ died and rose again, and he therefore is living proof of our living hope. Listen to the way the writer of Hebrews puts it now. This is Hebrews chapter six. And we read this, he says this, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, steadfast and sure. It enters the inner sanctuary where Jesus has gone as our forerunner, he entered on our behalf. What Hebrews is saying is this, we have this hope. It's an anchor for the soul. It's a certain thing. And we have it because Jesus Christ has already made it on our behalf. He's already gone to the far horizon. He's conquered death, risen again, and ascended to God as a human being and guaranteed then that we as human beings will also, when we die, ascend to God and dwell in glory forever. In other words, the risen Jesus is our future. <laughs> He's where we're headed if we are in Christ He's showing us the way forward. The language Hebrews uses is he's our forerunner or our pioneer, and he's already entered, listen, on our behalf. He's gone there as one of us and showing us the way. Imagine it like a team of rock climbers who arrive at the face of a, a, a challenging rock climb, a cliff, and uh, they choose a lead climber. And this is the person really that the whole team, their hopes depend on because the lead climber will pioneer the routes. They will take on the challenge. And if they slip, they are exposed. But if they make it to the top, they then set up an anchor. That's the word we climbers use, an anchor point or a belay. They fasten the rope to the rock. And that rope that is now bolted to the rock at the top is also the same rope that is attached to the waist of the climber at the bottom. They are now secured in the highest position. And as they climb up, the rope holds them. They may slip, but the lead climber will not let them fall. They are being brought up to the position that the lead climber has already ascended to. That's our Christian hope, right? Jesus Christ is the lead climber. He's pioneered the routes for our humanity to experience the ultimate hope of resurrection and glory. He's already made it. And so, yes, we are climbing and we're vulnerable and we're, one day we will die. But the rope around our waist that gives us the tug of assurance is this. We are connected to him. He's already arrived. We may slip, but he will not let us fall. He is our living hope. And the way the writer of Hebrews puts it, he is bringing many sons and daughters to glory. We are connected to him. We're going where he's already gone. That's why our hope is so living and certain. One of the beautiful moments, if you've ever tried rock climbing or mountain climbing, is called topping out. And it's the moment where having faced the threat and the challenge of the cliff face in front of you, all of a sudden you climb up to the top and suddenly you, your head pokes out over the top of the cliff and you see a new perspective. 
no longer is the cliff staring you in the face, you're over that now. There you see the lead climber who's brought you all the way up. There you experience the new reality of life on the other side. Can you imagine the moment when we will top out in glory? One day, not too far away, we will be beyond the challenges and the intimidation and the threats of this life and we will top out into glory and there we will see our Lord Jesus Christ who's brought us all the way and the Bible says this, this is incredible now, he says that when we see him we will be like him. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean it would be amazing to be with him but the Bible says you won't just be with him, you will be like him. You can see what he is like in revelations and visions that John has in the book of Revelation. He is full of dazzling and stunning and beautiful glory, rippling and, 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 and alive with this incredible resurrection life. And the Bible says, and, and when you see him, you will become like him. If you want to get your head around this, you should read The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, where he tries to capture what it would be like for someone who lives our quality of human existence, our shadowy form of existence. He tries to capture what it would be like for us to experience the full life that is ours on the other side, to be like Jesus. And he says, um, he, he has this moment where an angel is showing one of us, an earthling or a shadow creature around this new creation paradise. And it's all so solid. The, the person tries to pick up a, a leaf and they can't even lift a leaf off the floor. Everything's so much more real than they are. Don't think that we are the real concrete reality and that the, the, the life beyond death is this sort of vacuous, shadowy, ghostly, floating around on clouds. No, no, it's so much more solid than we are, right? That's why the resurrection body of Jesus, that's why he can walk through doors and pass through this reality. It's not because he's flimsy, it's because this world is so flimsy, he can just move through it. He's so solid and powerful and real. Well, anyway, in this experience, one of us from this life is exploring the new creation and uh, the, the angel, um, that they begin to see someone coming over the horizon and all of a sudden it, it's full of glory and this person that comes towards them is dazzling and beautiful and they they fall down almost as if they should worship this person and they say to the angel is this the one is this you know meaning is this the messiah and the angel laughs and he says no 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 he says no no this is this is someone you've never even heard of this is sarah smith she used to live in golders green in london and now look at her that's the idea i love the way it captures the simple idea if you could imagine, if you could see yourself as you will be in glory, you would be overwhelmed by what you will become. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our future. When we see him, we will be like him. We will one day be rippling and shining with the glory of God in resurrection bodies that are so much more solid and real than anything we've known in this life. Can I say this to you? Whatever state you're in physically today, you may be very sick and poorly. You may know people who are sick and even dying. You may be very strong and you may be, you know, ripped and, and exercising really well right now. Can I say it doesn't matter? Whichever state, you, whatever state you're in physically today, you are nothing but a shadow of your future self. I love that idea. It, it, I think I credit it to Tom Wright who makes the, makes the point. We often speak of people who are further on in life and we say they're nothing that I'm afraid they're a shadow of their former self. Listen, if you're a Christian, you're only a shadow of your future self. If you could just see what you will be like, you would realize we have a glorious and certain hope on that far horizon. Now, that hope that we have ahead of us shines back to fill us with hope in the present moment. The hope on the far horizon, when you see it for what it is, it shines hope back to us in the present moment. It says, because Jesus rose on Easter Sunday, because our resurrection glory is secured, we can live with hope right here and now. How does this hope give us confidence and courage on the near horizon that whatever challenges we're facing, we can have hope? Well, firstly, can I say it does give us those two words, confidence and courage. Confidence is something like this. It means basically it's the assumption that it's going to be okay. <laughs> life, it's, it's going to be okay in the end, even if life is scary. 
There's a great uh, film called uh, The Marigold uh, Hotel or something like that. And in, uh, I say a great film, I can never remember films, all their titles. And in that, there has a, a brilliant line. It says simply this, uh, it'll be okay. It'll be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, then it's not the end. It'll be well in the end. If it's not well, it's not the end. And I like that idea that in the end, life is going to be resolved. We will have in glory all the realities that we would enjoy in this life. And so that means we can have confidence here and now that whatever we're facing, nothing can take away the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The early Christians had this kind of confidence. They knew that even if life was challenging now, they had a hope that nothing could remove. In fact, they faced the threat of persecution, not just sickness and illness, but severe persecution. The Roman emperors would have early Christians thrown into amphitheaters where lions and bears would attack them and tear them to pieces and crowds would gather as if it was some kind of sport and they faced horrendous challenges. And yet as they faced them, they faced them with a confidence that the Romans couldn't understand. In fact, the Romans became increasingly interested and many converted by the Christian faith because they realized that even when the chips are down, when life is horrendous, Christians live with confidence. Jesus Christ is risen. I have a solid and certain hope and nothing can take that away. I went and visited my auntie recently who's very ill with cancer and almost certainly Medically speaking, there's no hope of her recovery. She will probably go to be with the Lord soon. And yet, as I met with her, her body wasting away, and yet she sparkled in her eyes with the hope of Jesus Christ. And she said, uh, quoted a verse, um, paraphrased a verse in the New Testament, and she simply said this, you know, I'm though outwardly, I'm wasting away. Inwardly, she said, I'm getting younger every day. I'm, I'm getting closer to home every day. That is the kind of confidence that we can live with. Whatever we face in this life, whatever challenges come our way through this coronavirus season or otherwise, we have a robust hope that gives us confidence even when life is scary. I remember uh, I used to go sailing uh, once a year with some friends, still do down in Cornwall. And one time we sailed to the Scilly Isles overnight. It was an absolutely beautiful experience. And we arrived as the sun was rising in the morning and we dropped anchor the next night off one of the islands. And in the night, the, the wind got up and the waves rose. And I'm not really very confident at sea, to be honest. And I got scared. And I remember getting up in the night, I couldn't sleep and pacing around the boats, thinking we were drifting towards the rocks. And I was worried. And in the end, I sort of woke up the, the captain who owned the, the yacht. And I said, you know, we're, we're in trouble. <laughs> and uh, he kind of got up and he had a look around and assessed the situation. And I remember him saying to me, I'll never forget what he said. He looked at me and he said, have you seen the size of our anchor? <laughs> go back to bed, we're fine. He knew that whilst we were this small vulnerable thing, we were attached to this great solid thing that was not going to budge. Can I ask you, as you face the challenges of this season, have you seen the size of our anchor? What does Hebrews say? We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. We are roped to Jesus Christ. We may feel very fragile and vulnerable, blown around by the winds and the waves, but he is not budging. He is secure in glory, the ascended Lord, and we are anchored to him. We can have a good night's sleep. Go back to bed, you're fine. You can have a good night's sleep tonight, confident in this, that Jesus Christ is our living hope and nothing can separate us from him. So the hope on the far horizon gives us confidence. We can live with confidence on the near horizon, but also gives us courage. Confidence, but also courage. Because of this confidence, we don't need to live sheltered and fearful existence. Christians have been marked down through the centuries as being people of courage. You know, there is an old myth that says that the more you think about the life to come, the future hope, the less effective you become in this life. And I love the way that C.S. Lewis takes this idea down in one of his writings. And he says this, he says this is quite the opposite. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most about the next. It is since Christians have largely stopped thinking about this next life that they have become so ineffective in this. And I think he's right. If you look through the history, you'll see 
that Christians who knew the hope that they have to come became the most courageous and bold and effective in this life. Why? Well, because if you know that your ultimate hope cannot be lost, if you know that this life is not all that we've got, you don't need to get every bit of personal pleasure here and now. You don't need to live the dream here and now in some fearful and fretful way. The fear of missing out on everything if I don't have what I need now, that, that just makes us paralyzed. It's hard to make good decisions when you think that everything depends on your decision and you have to get happy now. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. No, no, the Christian says, no, no, no. Tomorrow, beyond this life, I live. That's where my hope is. So I can live free from that kind of fear and paralysis now. I can live a bold and confident life. I can be the most useful in this life precisely because it's not all that I've got. I'm living for something bigger and better beyond. Now, down through the centuries, this has inspired Christians to do extraordinary things. During this coronavirus season, as soon as it hit, I was reminded of a chapter I'd read in a book called The Rise of Christianity. I encourage you to read this. There's a chapter in there, and the argument is that Christianity became so influential in the ancient world precisely because of how it responded to pandemics and disease. Christians demonstrated their hope when the chips were down because instead of running away from the plagues as they entered cities, the pagans ran out in fear, the Christians went in in love. They didn't consider their own lives something just to be grasped onto. They gave their lives away caring for those with the disease. I think that's inspiring as we think of the incredible work that our NHS workers are doing. Boldness and courage all over our nation and the world right now to care for those in the greatest of need. I heard of one Italian doctor who was a Christian who, if you like, broke all the conventions or all of the recommendations to sit with dying patients because he wanted them to experience love as they died. In the end, he contracted the disease and he died a courageous ending to a man who was convinced that Jesus Christ is risen so I can live a bold and courageous life. Listen, I want to encourage you. I know that this is a time of social isolation. We need to stay within those boundaries, but in how we operate, in how we think, in how we think about our finances, in how we think about our health, in how we think about our future. Let's not hide away, spiritually speaking. Let's be bold and courageous. Let's display the hope that we have in Jesus Christ because Christ is risen. Life is not a hopeless end, but an endless hope. We can live firstly with confidence, sleep well tonight, whatever is happening in this world, Nothing can take away the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We are roped to him. He's bringing us to glory. We are anchored to him. Have you seen the size of our anchor? With that confidence, let's live with courage. Let's be Christians who display to the world around us that this hope is real and practical and powerful. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade that is kept in heaven for you. Well, as we finish this message, as we think about the hope we have on the future, as we allow it to shine back to our lives in the present, would you allow me just to pray for you and for all your challenges that this will be your living hope too. Let's join together in a moment of prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you today that whatever challenges we are facing on this near horizon, Christ is risen and we have a sure and certain hope on that far horizon. I pray for everyone who's watching right now that you would allow them to experience the beautiful warm rays of sunshine hope, this cosmic sunrise of Jesus's resurrection that has beaten death and secured a final outcome for our human story that is good and glorious. Let those rays shine back into our lives and give us confidence. Firstly, I pray for good sleep and confident living for those who are fearful. May they know the size of the anchor they're attached to. They are not alone and vulnerable. They are secured through Jesus Christ. And I pray for courage. May we not be those who are timid and fearful at this time. May we be those who are bold and courageous, sharing this hope with everyone we can in every practical and spiritual way. 
We thank you, Lord, that we have been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you so much for joining our worship this morning. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed that really inspiring message uh, from Andrew and the Bible Society. Um, may we put our hope in Christ, in Christ alone, for in him we have the, the greatest love of all. Hallelujah. Um, look, I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you for joining us uh, in this worship time. Uh, may God bless you. Uh, may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Spirit rest upon us this day and forevermore. May we put our trust in him. May we go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So look, I, I look forward to seeing you in the next few weeks, uh, whether it's at uh, Songs of Praise, uh, our Ash Wednesday service or uh, our Rosher service, uh, or sometime perhaps on a Lent course. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, then please, please do. Um, but I look forward to seeing you soon and have a wonderful week. God bless. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering.
an exchange.